Story four of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day Ten Christmas Stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story four Daily Bread Parts one, two, and three. One A Question of Nourishment. And how is he? said Robert, as he came in from his day's work, in every moment of which he had thought of his child. He spoke in a whisper to his wife, who met him in the narrow entry at the head of the stairs, and in a whisper she replied, "'He is certainly no worse,' said Mary. "'The doctor says maybe a shade better. At least,' she said, sitting on the lower step and holding her husband's hand, and still whispering, "'at least he said that the breathing seemed to him a shade easier. One lung seemed to him a little more free and that it is now a matter of time and nourishment. Nourishment? Yes, nourishment, and I own my heart sunk as he said so. Poor little thing, he loathes the slops, and I told the doctor so. I told him the struggle and fight to get them down his poor little throat gave him more flush and fever than anything. And then he begged me not to try that again, asked if there were really nothing that the child would take, and suggested everything so kindly. But the poor little thing, weak as he is, seems to rise up with supernatural strength against them all. I am not sure, though, but perhaps we may do something with the old milk and water. That is really my only hope now, and that is the reason I spoke to you so cheerfully." Then poor Mary explained more at length that Emily had brought in Dr. Cummings' manual about the use of milk with children, and that they had sent round to the Corlisses, who always had good milk, and had set a pint according to the direction and formula, and that though dear little Jamie had refused the groats and the barley, and I know not what else, that at six he had gladly taken all the watered milk they dared to give him and that it now had rested on his stomach half an hour, so that she could not but hope that the tide had turned, only she hoped with trembling, because he had so steadily refused cow's milk only the week before. This rapid review in her entry of the bulletins of a day is really the beginning of this Christmas story. No matter which day it was, it was a little before Christmas, and one of the shortest days, but I have forgotten which. Enough that the baby, for he was a baby still, just entering his thirteenth month, enough that he did relish the milk so carefully measured and prepared, and hour by hour took his little dole of it as if it had come from his mother's breast. Enough that three or four days went by so, the little thing lying so still on his back in his crib, his lips still so blue, and his skin of such deadly color against the white of his pillow, and that twice a day, as Dr. Morton came in and felt his pulse and listened to the panting, he smiled and looked pleased and said, We are getting on better than I dared expect. Only every time he said, Does he still relish the milk? and every time was so pleased to know that he took to it still, and every day he added a teaspoonful or two to the hourly dole, and so poor Mary's heart was lifted day by day. This lasted till St. Victoria's Day. Do you know which day that is? It is the second day before Christmas, and here, properly speaking, the story begins. 2. St. Victoria's Day St. Victoria's Day the doctor was full two hours late. Mary was not anxious about this. She was beginning to feel bravely about the boy, and no longer counted the minutes till she could hear the doorbell ring. When he came he loitered in the entry below, or she thought he did. He was long coming upstairs, and when he came in she saw that he was excited by something, was really, even then, panting for breath. "'I am here at last,' he said. "'Did you think I should fail you?' "'Why, no. Poor innocent Mary had not thought any such thing. She had known he would come, and Baby was so well that she had not minded his delay. 
Morton looked up at the close-drawn shades, which shut out the light, and said, "'You did not think of the storm?' "'Storm? No,' said poor Mary. She had noticed, when Robert went to the door at seven, and she closed it after him, that some snow was falling. But she had not thought of it again. She had kissed him, told him to keep up good heart, and had come back to her baby. Then the doctor told her that the storm which had begun before daybreak had been gathering more and more severely, that the drifts were already heavier than he remembered them in all his Boston life, that after half an hour's trial in his sleigh he had been glad to get back to the stable with his horse, and that all he had done since he had done on foot, with difficulty she could not conceive of. He had been so long downstairs when he brushed the snow off that he might be fit to come near the child. "'And really, Mrs. Walter, we are doing so well here,' he said cheerfully, "'that I will not try to come round this afternoon unless you see a change. If you do, your husband must come up for me, you know. But you will not need me, I am sure.' Mary felt quite brave to think that they should not need him really for twenty-four hours, and said so, and added, with the first smile he had seen for a fortnight, I do not know anybody to whom it is of less account than to me whether the streets are blocked or open. Only I am sorry for you. Poor Mary! How often she thought of that speech before Christmas Day went by! but she did not think of it all through St. Victoria's Day. Her husband did not come home to dinner. She did not expect him. The children came from school at two, rejoicing in the long morning session and the half-holiday of the afternoon which had been earned by it. They had some story of their frolic in the snow, and after dinner went quietly away to their little playroom in the attic. And Mary sat with her baby all the afternoon, nor wanted other company. She could count his breathing now, and knew how to time it by the watch, and she knew that it was steadier and slower than it was the day before, and really he almost showed an appetite for the hourly dole. Her husband was not late, he had taken care of that, and had left the shop an hour early, and as he came in and looked at the child from the other side of the crib, and smiled so cheerfully on her, Mary felt that she could not enough thank God for his mercy. 3. St. Victoria's Day in the Country Five and twenty miles away was another mother, with a baby born the same day as Jamie. Mary had never heard of her, and never has heard of her, and unless she reads this story, never will hear of her till they meet together in the other home, look each other in the face, and know as they are known. Yet their two lives, as you shall see, are twisted together, as indeed are all lives, only they do not know it, as how should they? A great day for Huldah Stevens was this St. Victoria's Day, not that she knew its name more than Mary did. Indeed, it was only of late years that Huldah Stevens had cared much for keeping Christmas Day. But of late years they had all thought of it more, and this year on Thanksgiving Day, at old Mr. Stevens, after great joking about the young people's housekeeping, it had been determined, with some banter, that the same party should meet with John and Huldah on Christmas Eve, with all Huldah's side of the house besides, to a late dinner or early supper, as the guests might please to call it. Little difference between the meals, indeed, was there ever in the profusion of these country homes. The men folks were seldom at home at the noonday meal, call it what you will, for they were all in the milk business, as you will see. And what with collecting the milk from the hill farms, on the one hand, and then carrying it for delivery at the three o'clock morning milk train, on the other hand, any hours which you, dear reader, might consider systematic, or of course in country life, were certainly always set aside. But after much conference, as I have said, it had been determined at the Thanksgiving party that all hands in both families should meet at John and Huldah's as near three o'clock as they could the day before Christmas, 
and then and there Huldah was to show her powers in entertaining at her first state family party. So this St. Victoria's Day was a great day of preparation for Huldah, if she had only known its name, as she did not, for she was of the kind which prepares in time, not of the kind that is caught out when the company come with the work half done and as john started on his collection beat that morning at about the hour robert in town kissed mary good-bye huldah stood on the step with him and looked with satisfaction on the gathering snow because it would make better sleighing the next day for her father and mother to come over she charged him not to forget her box of raisins when he came back and to ask at the express if anything came up from town bade him good-bye, and turned back into the house, not wholly satisfied to be almost alone. She washed her baby, gave him his first lunch, and put him to bed. Then, with the coast fairly clear, what woman does not enjoy a clear coast if it only be early enough in the morning, she dipped boldly and wisely into her flour-barrel, stripped her plump round arms to their work, and began on the pie-crust, which was to appear to-morrow in the fivefold forms of apple, cranberry, marlboro, mince, and squash, careful and discriminating in the nice chemistry of her mixture and the nice manipulations of her handicraft, but in no wise dreading the issue. A long, active, lively morning she had of it. Not dissatisfied with the stages of her work, step by step she advanced, stage by stage she attained of the elaborate plan which was well laid out in her head but of course had never been entrusted to words far less to tell-tale paper from the oven at last came the pies and she was satisfied with the colour from the other oven came the turkey which she proposed to have cold as a relay or pièce de résistance for any who might not be at hand at the right moment for dinner. Into the empty oven went the clove-blossoming ham, which, as it boiled, had given the least appetizing odor to the kitchen. In the pretty moulds in the woodshed stood the translucent cranberry, hardening to its fixed consistency. In other moulds the obedient calf's foot already announced its willingness and intention to gel as she directed. Huldah's decks were cleared again, her kitchen table fit to cut out work upon, all the pans and plates were put away, which accumulate so mysteriously where cooking is going forward. On its nail hung the weary jigger, on its hook the spicy grater, on the roller a fresh towel. Everything gave sign of victory, the whole kitchen looking only a little nicer than usual. Huldah herself was dressed for the afternoon, and so was the baby, and nobody but as acute observers as you and I would have known that she had been in action all along the line, and had won the battle at every point, when two o'clock came, the earliest moment at which her husband ever returned. Then, for the first time, it occurred to Huldah to look outdoors and see how fast the snow was gathering. She knew it was still falling, but the storm was a quiet one, and she had had too much to do to be gaping out of the windows. She went to the shed door, and to her amazement saw that the north woodpile was wholly drifted in. Nor could she, as she stood, see the fences of the roadway. Huldah ran back into the house, opened the parlor door, and drew up the curtain, to see that there were indeed no fences on the front of the house to be seen. On the northwest, where the wind had full sweep, between her and the barn, the ground was bare, but all that snow, and who would say how much more, was piled up in front of her, so that unless Huldah had known every landmark, she would not have suspected that any road was ever there. She looked uneasily out at the northwest windows, but she could not see an inch to windward. Dogged snow, 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 as if it would never be done. Huldah knew very well, then, that there was no husband for her in the next hour, nor most like in the next or the next. 
She knew very well, too, what she had to do, and knowing it, she did it. She tied on her hood and buttoned tight around her her rough sack, passed through the shed and crossed that bare strip to the barn, opened the door with some difficulty, because snow was already drifting into the doorway, and entered. She gave the cows and oxen their water and the two night horses theirs, went up into the loft and pitched down hay enough for all, went downstairs to the pigs and cared for them, took one of the barn shovels and cleared a path where she had had to plunge into the snow at the doorway, took the shovel back, and then crossed home again to her baby. She thought she saw the Empson's chimney smoking as she went home, and that seemed companionable. She took off her overshoes, sack, and hood, said aloud, This will be a good stay-at-home day, brought round her desk to the kitchen table, and began on a nice long letter to her brother Cephas in Seattle. That letter was finished, eight good quarto pages written, and a long-delayed letter to Emily Tabor, whom Hilda had not seen since she was married. And a long pull at her milk accounts had brought them up to date. And still no John. Hulda had the table all set, you may be sure of that. But for herself she had had no heart to go through the formalities of lunch or dinner. A cup of tea and something to eat with it, as she wrote, did better, she thought, for her, and she could eat when the men came. It is a way women have. Not till it became quite dark, and she set her kerosene lamp in the window that he might have a chance to see it when he turned the locust grove corner, did Huldah once feel herself lonely, or permit herself to wish that she did not live in a place where she could be cut off from all her race. If John had gone into partnership with Joe Winter, and we had lived in Boston! This was the thought that crossed her mind. Dear Huldah, from the end of one summer to the beginning of the next, Joe Winter does not go home to his dinner, and what you experience to-day, so far as absence from your husband goes, is what his wife experiences in Boston ten months, save Sundays, in every year. I do not mean that Huldah winced or whined. Not she. Only she did think if. Then she sat in front of the stove and watched the coals, and for a little while continued to think if. Not long. Very soon she was engaged in planning how she would arrange the table to-morrow, whether Mother Stevens should cut the chicken pie, or whether she would have that in front of her own mother. Then she fell to planning what she would make for Cynthia's baby, and then to wondering whether Cephas was in earnest in that half-nonsense he wrote about Sybil Dyer, and then the clock struck six. No bells yet, no husband, no anybody. Lantern out and lighted, rubber boots on, hood and sack, shed shovel in one hand, lantern in the other, Roadway still bare, but a drift as high as Hulda's shoulders at the barn door. Lantern on the ground, snow shovel in both hands now. One, two, three, one cubic foot out. One, two, three, another cubic foot out. And so on, and so on, and so on, till the doorway is clear again. Lantern in one hand, snow shovel in the other, we enter the barn, draw the water for cows and oxen, we shake down more hay, and see to the pigs again. This time we make beds of straw for the horses and the cattle. Nay, we linger a minute or two, for there is something companionable there. Then we shut them in, in the dark, and cross the well-cleared roadway to the shed, and so home again. Certainly Mrs. Empson's kerosene lamp is in her window, that must be her light, which gives a little halo in that direction in the falling snow. That looks like society. And this time Hulda undresses the baby, puts on her yellow flannel nightgown, makes the hole as long as it may be, and then, still making believe, be jolly, lights another lamp, eats her own supper, clears it away, 
and cuts into the new harper which john had brought up to her the day before but the harper is dull reading to her though generally so attractive and when her plymouth hollow clock consents to strike eight at last huldah who has stinted herself to read till eight gladly puts down the travels in arizona which seemed to her as much like the travels in peru of the month before as those had seemed like the travels in chinchilla rubber boots again lantern again sack and hood again the men will be in no case for milking when they come so huldah brings together their pails takes her shovel once more and her lantern digs out the barn drift again and goes over to milk little carrie and big fanchon for though the milking of a hundred cows passes under those roofs and out again every day huldah is far too conservative to abandon the custom which she inherits from some thorfinn or some elfrida and her husband is well pleased to humour her in keeping in that barn always at least two of the choicest three-quarter blood cows that he can choose for the family supply only in general he or reuben milks them as duties are divided there this is not huldah's share but on this eve of st spiridion the gentle creatures were glad when she came in and in two journeys back and forth huldah had carried her well-filled pails into her dairy this helped along the hour and just after nine o'clock struck she could hear the cheers of the men at last she ran out again with the ready lighted lantern to the shed door in an instant had on her boots and sack and hood had crossed to the barn and slid open the great barn door and stood there with her light another hero for another leander to buffet towards through the snow a sight to see were the two men to be sure and a story indeed they had to tell on their different beats they had fought snow all day had been breaking roads with the help of the farmers where they could had had to give up more than half of the outlying farms sending such messages as they might that the outlying farmers might bring down to-morrow's milk to such stations as they could arrange and at last by good luck had both met at the depot in the hollow where each had gone to learn at what hour the milk train might be expected in the morning little reason was there indeed to expect it at all nothing had passed the station master since the morning express called lightning by satire had slowly pushed up with three or four engines five hours behind its time and just now had come down a messenger from them that he should telegraph to boston that they were all blocked up at tyler's summit the snow drifting beneath their wheels faster than they could clear it above the station master said nothing whatever had yet passed winchenden five engines had gone out from fichtberg eastward but in the whole day they had not come as far as leominster it was very clear that no milk train nor any other train would be on time the next morning such was in brief john's report to huldah when they had got to that state of things in which a man can make a report that is after they had rubbed dry the horses had locked up the barn after the men had rubbed themselves dry and had put on dry clothing and after each of them sitting on the fireside of the table had drunk his first cup of tea and eaten his first square cubit of dipped toast after the dipped toast they were going to begin on huldah's fried potatoes and sausages huldah heard their stories with all their infinite little details knew every corner and turn by which they had husbanded strength and life was grateful to the corbetts and varnums and prescotts and the rest who with their oxen and their red right hands had given such loyal help for the common good and she heaved a deep sigh when the story ended with the verdict of the failure of the whole no trains on time to-morrow bad for the boston babies said reuben bluntly giving words to what the others were feeling poor little things said huldah alice has been so pretty all day and she gulped down just one more sigh disgusted with herself as she remembered that if 
of the afternoon, if John had only gone into partnership with Joe Winter. End of Story 4 Parts 1, 2, and 3